started the series a few weeks back on the secrets of a giant killer just trying to give you some insight on some of the giants that we face could you pull that down just a little bit autumn it seems like it's a little hot up here but we face all kinds of giants all kinds of assignments we tried to reveal some of those to you give you some insight about the principalities, the spirits that manipulate and control not just individuals, but oftentimes entire people groups. But let me just give you some information maybe that you didn't know. You were created for conflict. I know a lot of people don't like conflict. You were created for conflict. You were built for battle. You're a warrior. You are a soldier in the Lord's army. And the Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You need not think That you can float through life without any storms. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Storms are coming. You're going to face some storms. You're going to face some battles. You're going to face some conflicts. You're going to face some difficult times. But God created us in His image to deal with with the attacks and the assignments. You never read Exodus 15 verse 3 that says God is a man of war. If he's a man of war and we are created in his image, guess what? You were created for conflict. You were built for battle. So why do you get upset when a storm comes? That is the very thing that you were created to deal with. Yet we want to cop out and flop over and give up and quit and cry. You're a warrior. Some of you didn't know you were a warrior. You're a warrior. And the more battles you go into, the stronger you get, the the wiser you get the more equipped you are to deal with the next assignment, the next battle, the next storm, the next challenge. I mean, look at your own life. Aren't you better equipped than you were 10 years ago? See? Aren't you better equipped than you were 20 years ago? My God, if I knew when I was 20 what I know now, We're growing. We're overcoming. So don't back up when you see the storm, when you see the giant, when you see the battle. I did the series on eagles not long ago, and we brought an eagle in here, and we taught you how eagles are. Eagles rise. They, they use the storm, the thermals, the currents to go higher and higher. Because the higher you go, the better vision you have, the better insight, the better perspective. And the the higher you go, the smaller your problems are. Yet we want to just cry and quit and whine. Do something about it. You're built for battle. Kill the giant. Defeat the giant. Slay the giant. Don't let him keep working you over. Get back up. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just stand back up and say, I'm back. Should have killed me when you had the chance. I'm back. Sometimes when you just do that and then just shout, Jesus. Demons tremble. At the name of Jesus. So I'm going to introduce a giant to you today. 
that you all know. You may not have known that you know, but before I get through, you're going to know this giant. Now, David defeated Goliath. A cycle was broken, a 40-day cycle when David went out and dealt with him. And could I tell you that assignments are meant to be broken? Giants are meant to be killed? They're meant to be defeated? And after, after David killed Goliath, then Sibekiah defeated Saph. Saph was called who? He's right over here. The threshold giant. Ben, come help me. Come be Saf for me. Come stand here and be that big baby face giant. See, they try to grow a little thing like that to camouflage you, but he's still a baby. And Saf stands at the threshold when you're over here trying to go to your new season, to your new place. He stands there to stop you and says, no, you're not going. And at the first sign of the assignment, of the attack, of the giant, of the storm, we, we just give up. We quit. When the truth is, God wants us to go to the next season. And then, Stephen, come help me. Stephen's going to be you. Hurry, run up here, run up here. You're taking my preaching time. All right, this is you. This is Stephen. He's married to Rita. I'm Stephen. I'm married to Rita. Can you believe that? So this is you. And you've just killed Goliath. Goliath is down. A cycle has been broken. And God has spoken to you and said, okay, I want you to go into ministry. I want you to start a business. I want you to go to a new place, a new season, a new relationship. Whatever it is, it's a new season in your life because life is a collection of seasons. So it's time to go to a new season. You've just killed Goliath, and you start going to your new season. You're excited. You've got all these plans. Everything is good. And you start to go, and you, you encounter Saf. But understand, David... David imparted the anointing to kill giants to his servants. He didn't keep it to himself. He was not the only giant killer. And that's why faith comes by hearing and hear by the word of God, but also faith can be imparted to you. When you get around faith people, it will build your faith. When you see somebody else can kill a giant, then you can kill your giant. And when somebody sees you kill your giant, it encourages them, they can kill their giant. So God sends another servant, one of David's servants. He sends Sibachai, whose name means one who is like a corpse, one who is like a dead man, to kill Saf. So he kills Saf. Saf goes down. Go down, Saf. And so you cross the threshold and you go to your next season. You left Saf back there. And now you're out here, you're, you are excited, you've crossed the threshold, you've killed giants, things are going your way. And guess what? You encounter another giant. Caleb, come help me. You encounter Lami. Lami, he's not babyface Nelson over here. Lami is more experienced. He is an experienced water, uh, warrior. And he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy all that you have. He wants to take your joy. He wants to take your finances. He wants to take your resources. He wants to take your relationships. He wants to keep you broke, busted, and disgusted, as they say. So when you get to that new season, you've killed this giant. You're ready to go. You've got it all planned out. And then you encounter this giant named Lami, and he wants to steal and take everything for you. But God anoints you with the spirit of El Hanan because David sent El Hanan to kill him. And El Hanan, his name means God has given. God is a giver. He provides. See, when, when the enemy sends to steal, God says, no, no, I've given to you. I've blessed you. I've given you resources and relationships and finances. So guess what? 
that anointing comes on you and you deal with that assignment, you deal with that giant, and Lamy goes down. Go down, Lamy. Are you getting the picture? So then, praise God, we've, we've broken through and you feel like this is it. I'm going, I'm going to see some great things happen. And guess what? There is another giant. First Chronicles chapter 20. Yet again, there was war in gas. Somebody say again. Amen. Understand that every time you defeat a giant, you defeat an assignment, guess what? If you live any length of time at all, there's going to be another war. There's going to be another giant. There's going to be another assignment. There's going to be another storm. This is life. Wake up. This is life. He never said it would be smooth sailing all the time. It's not. There are storms. Now, there are mountains. There are victories. There are wonderful times, but there are also battles. And so, yet again, there was war at Gath, and there was a man of great stature. The Bible doesn't even give him a name. He was so big, they said he was just great stature. He was, one translation said he was a huge man. And watch this. He had 24 fingers and toes. He was so big, he needed six toes on each feet to balance. His sword was so big. His spear was so big. He needed six fingers on each hand to hold it. He was the big boy. He was a monster. He was a warrior. He was experienced. No doubt he was older. Theo, come help me. So here's you. You show up. You've just defeated Goliath. You've defeated Saf. You've defeated Lami. You're ready to go. And now, guess what? You run into the giant of great stature. He is a monster. He is a warrior. He's been around a long time. You don't want to miss this. Get this insight. How many fingers did he have? How many toes did he have on each foot? Total of 24. Six is the number of man in the Bible. On the sixth day, God created man. Six is also the number of the flesh because we are flesh. We are flesh and bone. Come on, somebody. So six is the number of man. So this man, this giant, this huge giant, the number of six whom the Bible calls the giant of great stature, he is your flesh. He is your own worst enemy because we are our own worst enemies. When we, when we defeat Goliath and break a cycle, it should be broken. And then we encounter Saf, who tries to stop us from crossing the threshold. We deal with him, and we come and we defeat Lami. And Lami goes down, he, even though he's tried to keep you broke and take your resources. And one of the most difficult battles to break is that resource battle, that financial battle, that, that blessing of God that he wants to give you. The devil wants to steal it all. 50% of marriages are broken in America. Divorce takes place because people don't have the resources or they don't know how to handle money and they fight and they fuss over money and they get a divorce. 50%. Christians and non-Christians. So you deal with him and you get your finances in order and you're thinking, I've got it now. I mean, that's what, that was my fear. I was, I was afraid I'd lose my house. I was afraid I'd lose my car. I, I couldn't deal with that. And I was afraid I couldn't ever retire because I, I, I couldn't quit work. And you deal, him and deal with him, and he goes down, and you're thinking, praise God, I'm, I'm going to make it now. And then you encounter your flesh. You know what your flesh is? It's your lust, your desires. Let me translate. It's your greatest weakness. That's who this giant represents, your greatest weakness. Whatever it is, that is the weakest link in your chain, the weakest thing in your life, the thing that you battle with, the, thing, the secret sin that nobody knows about that you keep going back to. 
That's the flesh. That's the John of the flesh. And here's what the John of the flesh does. Stand right there. Come here, John of great stature. Come around on this side. Get him by the nap of the neck right here like this. And you're going to drag him backwards. Past Lamy. Watch this. Past the threshold giant to start over. To lap the mountain again. Even though you've already defeated these giants, the giant of great stature, which is our flesh, our own weakness, our greatest weakness, our, the things that we struggle with, the reason we keep lapping the mountain over and over and over and over is because our own sin, our own weakness. The giant of great stature is our flesh. It is self. It is man. It is me. I'm the one that keeps me from succeeding. I'm the one that keeps me from going to where God wants me to go. He gives me the anointing to kill the giants, but I get over here and I run into myself. I look myself in the mirror. I look at my flesh and, and I yield to the temptation, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he grabs me by the nap of the neck and he drags me backwards all the way over here to go around the mountain again. This John of great stature, he was from Gath also. Which as you know means to crush, to tread on. He had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each feet, on each foot, sorry. You have a foot, and you have two feet. But his name means to crush. And his agenda, his assignment, is to crush your flesh. To go to where your weakness is. What is your weakness? I don't know what your weakness is. I don't know what your secret sin is. I don't know what your battle is. But you've seen it in people's lives. You've probably seen it in your own life. It becomes a vicious cycle where we go around and around and around and around. Now, watch this. 1 John chapter 2 talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's look at it. In 1 John 2, see right there, coming back to you. For the world offers only a craving for pride. Physical pleasure, lust of the flesh, satisfy the flesh. Your body says, I don't care what anybody says, do it. If it feels good, do it. If you want to drink it, drink it. If you want to put it into your veins, put it in your veins. If you want to pop the pill, pop the pill. If you want to have a relationship with somebody, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman or whoever it is or a trio or a quartet or an orgy or whatever you want. Just do it. If it feels good, do it. It's okay. Not what the Bible says. That's what your flesh says. Your flesh says, it feels good. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go. I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to enjoy life. You only go around once, so I'm going to live fast, die young, and leave a good-looking corpse. And that's some people's philosophy. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. Number one, lust of the flesh. Also a craving for everything we see. Lust of the eyes. It looks good to us. We think, I'll take it. I'll buy it. I'll have it. And these, these spirits work together sometime, if you didn't know that. They work together. And then he said, and the pride. Pride in our achievements, our possessions. Look what I have done. Pride of life. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Did you know that Jesus was tempted in all these points, the Bible said, but did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth? In Matthew chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And you'd say, why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness so the devil could tempt him? So he could set the the path, the example for us, So that when we were tempted by the flesh, the giant of the flesh, we would have an example to overcome. So in in Matthew chapter 4, it says Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. He had fasted 40 days. And the devil said to him, see all these stones? And if you've ever been to Israel, there are millions of stones everywhere. Little rocks, big rocks, medium-sized rocks. They're all over the countryside. They're in many places. 
So no doubt when, when the devil led him out or when the, when the devil came to him and said, see all these stones, he had been, been fasting 40 days. He said, if you're the son of God, see, he was appealing to all three. He said, look at these stones. He said, if you're the son of God, turn them to bread. So he was appealing to the lust of the flesh because he was hungry. Lust of the eyes, he saw that. He said, just imagine all this is bread. And then he said, turn them to bread so you can eat and satisfy your flesh. In other words, show me who you are. So all three of these points, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, came to Jesus there. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So he overcame. And then the devil took him to the temple. High place. And he said, jump off. Commit suicide. If you're the son of God, because the Bible says, and and the devil misquoted the word of God. He will do that. He misquoted the word of God to Jesus, who is the word, and said, if you're really God, then just jump down. Commit suicide. Take your own life. And as your word says, the angels will bear you up. They will catch you, and you won't be hurt. So again, he's showing him the kingdom. He's showing him everything, lust of the eyes. He's saying, lust of the flesh. He's saying, jump off, kill yourself, take, take your own life, but show me who you are. If you're so powerful, if you're so God, then the angels will catch you. And again, Jesus overcame him. And then he took him to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, if you're really the son of God, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of this. How could the devil give him what was not his? But three times we see that Jesus was tempted just like you are tempted. Just like I'm tempted. Same thing. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. So it's a vicious cycle. So you repent. You pray. Go back down there, Theo. And you start over. You kill Goliath. You break the cycle. Good thing. You encounter Lamy. And you've dealt with Lamy before. You know how to deal him. So he goes down quickly. Boom. You come out here. You've been broke, but you've made money before. You know how to make money. So you, you deal with Lamy or with, uh, that's Saf. I'm sorry. This is Lamy. You deal with Lamy. He goes down because you've been there before. You've learned to make money. You make it, you lose it. You make it, you lose it. You make it, you lose it. Anybody know this cycle? And you deal with him. And now you're getting pretty good at this, so you just keep going. You're going to the next level. But guess what? You encounter the giant of great stature one more time. And so what does he do? He's the big boy. He gets you by the nap of the neck, and he drags you back across where you've already been, back across the threshold. And it becomes a vicious cycle. We repent We battle our flesh, we are deceived again, we sin again, we repent again, we we go back, we just go through this vicious cycle over and over and over and over, lapping the same mountain. So you do it again. You come across, you deal with Saf, you deal with Lami. By now, they, they they know that it's you coming, they just stay down. They, They know that you know how to deal with them. But you have not yet learned to deal with your own lust, your own flesh, your own sinful desires. And you keep them secret as long as you can. But until you learn to deal with your own flesh, it's a vicious cycle. And he's just going to grab you by the nap of the neck and drag you back across again. And you keep going around the same mountain over and over and over. You keep doing this vicious cycle over and over and over again. Maybe it's a generational curse. But generational curses are made to be broken. Just because your daddy was an alcoholic and your granddaddy was an alcoholic doesn't mean you have to be an alcoholic. Just because your daddy beat you and your granddaddy beat him and your great-granddaddy beat him doesn't mean you should beat your children or your wife. Come on, somebody. Just because somebody else in your family was a liar and a thief doesn't mean you need to be a liar and a thief. You can defeat the giant of the flesh. Jesus showed us how. He stood strong and firm on the word of God. And we stand strong and firm on the word of God. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean that we won't have a battle. But you can defeat 
the giant of great stature. I don't care how many toes and fingers he has to grip your neck or to try to take away your sword or try to render you powerless because God, through David, sent a warrior to deal with the giant of great stature. Theo, go back over there. And when you get this insight, you break the cycle. When you understand how to deal with Seth, that he's just a gentle giant anyway. Demonic spirit, yes. Manipulative, yes. Inexperienced warrior, son of the giant at the threshold, just standing there big and woolly trying to scare you and cause you to be afraid so you won't cross the threshold to start with. But once you cross it, you realize he cannot stop you, so you cross it. So you've learned that. And you know how to get the resources. You know how to deal with Lami. You know that God blesses us and he gives us increase. So when we are faithful to tithe and faithful to give and we break the assignment, we break the generational curse, we walk in the blessings of God. So then we encounter the giant of great stature. So what do we do? I'm glad you ask. First Chronicles 20, verse 7 and 8. So when this giant defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. <laughs> Look at somebody and say he died. He went down. Oh, come on, tell somebody. Tell them the giant of great stature went down. The giant of the flesh, your greatest enemy, went down. Because Jonathan had an anointing on him to kill the giant of great stature. And his name, the name Jonathan, means gift of God or grace. Gift of grace. Because it's God's grace that forgives us when we sin and we come back to the altar. And we repent and say, oh God, I'm sorry, I've messed up, I blew it. I don't know why I keep doing the same things. I don't know why I can't seem to get victory over that. It's God's grace. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved. It is the gift of God. See how all this goes together? Every verse in the Bible, every chapter in the Bible, every name in the Bible has meaning and it's all intertwined together. So God, through David, sends a warrior named Jonathan whose name means grace or gift of God, gift of grace, so that when you encounter your flesh and you encounter your own weaknesses and your own secret sins, you can receive the anointing for the grace of God to take that giant down. It's God's grace. It's not your strength. It's God's grace. It's God's anointing on your life. It's not your wisdom. It's not your ingenuity. It's, it's not your financial prowess. It's not your business knowledge. It is the anointing of God, the grace of God, that deals a death blow to the giant, and the giant must fall. God's grace and gift of mercy in your life will defeat even the biggest giant. Does that help anybody? I don't care how big he is. I don't care how many times you've lapped the mountain. Israel lapped the mountain in the wilderness for 40 years, but guess what? They came out. They crossed over. They went to the promised land. Forty is the number of testing. And for 40 years, they, they, they circled the mountain. They lapped the mountain in the wilderness. Forty years, what could have been done in 16 days. They could have gone from Egypt to the promised land in 16 days if they had just gone and obeyed God. But they got out in the wilderness. They dealt with the giants. They dealt with their own flesh, their own sins, their own weakness. Forty years. Forty, number of testing. But after 40 years, after 40 years, don't wait 40 years. The light came on. They crossed over the promised land. 41 is the number of breakthrough. 40 is the number of testing. 41 is the number of breakthrough. They broke through. They went into the promised land. They killed even the biggest giant. 
you can defeat every giant. 2 Corinthians 5, two verses, 17 and 21. When you get home, read the whole passage, but let me just key in on this. When anyone is in Christ, it is a whole new world. That doesn't sound like same cycle, same mountain. When you become a Christian, when anyone is in Christ, it is a whole new world. Let me just stop there and say, the assignments can be broken at the bloodline. They can. You have to believe that, and you can't keep going back. You can't keep looking back over your shoulder, longing for that flesh to satisfy your flesh. Jesus will satisfy your flesh. Jesus will fulfill the empty spots, the void in your life. But we must look to Jesus. It is a whole new world. The old things are gone. Gone. Don't invite them back. Don't invite your demons back. Don't go visit the places your demons live. Don't watch and read and take what your demons give out. Don't invite them. See, see the problem is our flesh. It's when we get victory, we, we want the flesh. We want that feeling again. We want what we had before. But all that did was shackle you and chain you and imprison you. That's all it did. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. We know some of the things that you did, we enjoy. The flesh loves to be satisfied, but it's like fire. It can never be quenched. It can never be satisfied. No matter how big a fire is, it wants to be bigger. No matter how much you try to satisfy your flesh, you can take cocaine, you can take crack, you can get that one high that first time, but you try to get it over and over again, and you can never satisfy that flesh. It will never be satisfied. Only Jesus will satisfy your soul the old things are gone suddenly everything is new Christ had no sin but God made him become sin so that in Christ we could be right with God you don't have to keep lapping the mountain the cycle can be broken so break it how do you do that you become a servant of God you live empowered you do the basic things this is called a Bible you read it. This is called prayer. You do it. This is called worship. You live it. It's a lifestyle. It's not an event that happens on Sunday. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's who we are. It's what we do every day. We become thankful. It's Thanksgiving weekend, but we should be thankful every day. Worship, thankfulness, gratefulness is a lifestyle. Genesis 1, he said, have dominion and subdue. The giant of the flesh. The giants are going down. You just have to keep going forward. Does that make sense? Does that help you? Give these folks a hand. Thank you. And please know that the names were changed to protect the innocent and... The role that was given to them had no bearing on who they are, what they're battling, or what kind of giant they are. I just randomly saw them and picked them, selected them to help me get a word to you today. Does that help? We make it so hard. It's not as hard as we make it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his only one son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus left heaven and came to this earth and became sin so that we through his sin might be free or right with God. Everything that we're in, folks, it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual war zone. We're in a war zone. And if you just, if you just nonchalantly float through life, even if you go to church, even if you came here, even if you got saved, if you don't wake up and realize we're in a battle, there is a battle going on. There is a war going on here. And it's not against flesh and blood, the Bible says. We war against principalities and powers. 
spiritual wickedness in high places. And we need every tool that God has for us to be victorious. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. John 4, 24 says God is a spirit and they that worship Him worship in spirit and in truth. So when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes in you and you receive the Spirit of God. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a different encounter. In Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul said to the disciples there, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Indicating it was a different experience from the salvation they received when they believed. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? He knew that they received the Spirit of God, John 4, 24. When they believed, the Spirit of God comes into you. When you repent, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit that he was talking about in Acts chapter 19 and five other times in the book of Acts was an infilling, a baptism. It was like being baptized in a pool of water. When you are baptized in water, You are the candidate for baptism. Somebody, a minister or somebody, baptizes you. You submit to them and they take you under the water. They baptize you and bring you back up. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're the candidate. You submit to Him and He submerges you in His Spirit. He saturates you in His Spirit. The Bible also teaches that when that experience takes place, three out of five times in the book of Acts, They spoke in another language, an unknown language. Glossolalia was the the original word there. It was other tongues. Sometimes when people speak in other tongues, it's it's a known language. It's been translated. Sometimes it's an unknown. It's just a heavenly language only between you and God. But we need every tool, every weapon we can to overcome the enemies that we encounter, the giants, the assignments, the storms, the challenges, because they're going to come. And the older we get and the wiser we get and the more faith we have, guess what? Every level, there's another devil. You cross the threshold, you deal with Goliath, you you deal with Saf, you deal with Lami, you deal with the giant of great stature, the flesh, he's the one that wants to keep dragging you back. But every time you go to another level in God, There's going to be another storm, another challenge, another assignment coming against you. But you get stronger each time. So don't be surprised when the storm comes. When you step to the next level, just be ready. The Bible says be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. Seeks whom he may devour. But you need to be awake, be alert, be ready. And know he's coming. And when he comes, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing that you have, deal with him. The giant's going down. The devil's going down. I'm going to show you. In this, if you don't have this book, where'd it go? There it is. If you don't have this book, you need to get it. Because it gives you the insight. You'll know where I'm going the next, the next week, the next couple Sundays. You need to get it. Next week we're going to talk about Ishbi You don't want to miss it. And then the next week there's another one. It's the devil's secret weapon. You don't want to miss it. Two weeks. Father, we need you. We need your insight. We need your revelation to overcome every assignment, every giant, every demon, every storm, every challenge, every generational curse. But Lord, we know that when you fill our heart with your love, with your power, with your Holy Spirit, we know that what is in us greater is he you that are in us than he that is in the world the giants the assignments that we face so father today we trust you we call on you for that anointing we ask you to help us once and for all to crucify the giant of the flesh we learn to deal with the other ones but the giant of the flesh knows our weaknesses he knows what we struggle with and he comes when we least expect and tries to take us down and to take us out so father I pray right now for the anointing of Jonathan the grace of the Holy Spirit the grace of God that you give to us the gift of grace 
that covers our sins, that covers our sins of the flesh. I pray for that anointing and that grace to touch everyone in this room and those under the sound of my voice now in Jesus' name. We pray for the anointing of Jonathan, that spirit of anointing that was on him. We pray for it now. Saturate us, fill this room, baptize us with that anointing to overcome the giant of the flesh, the giant of great stature. Anoint us now in Jesus' name. We receive that anointing. We receive it now. We walk in it now. We we allow you, God, to touch us and fill us and saturate us with that anointing. And the next time we face that temptation, the lust of the flesh, to the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Lord, we cast it down and we let that anointing rise in us to keep that devil down, to keep that giant defeated in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I know it's late, but if you're dealing with that giant of the flesh, run down here right now. I just want to pray for you. If you're dealing with it, you've got to overcome it. Come on right now. Come on quickly. Come on. Lift your hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we break that assignment. In Jesus' name, we break it now. We break it now. It's broken. We break it now. We break it in Jesus' name. We break it. We break it. We break the assignment of the flesh. We break it in Jesus' name. We break it in Jesus' name. Now lift your hands and praise Him. We break it now. We break it in Jesus' name. We break it, Father, in Jesus' name. We take the anointing of Jonathan in Jesus' name and we break the assignments. We break it. We break it. Come on, help me pray, church. Help me pray. We break the assignments. We break them. We break them in Jesus' name. We break them in Jesus' name. We break them now. In Jesus' name, we break the chains. We break the shackles. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, praise Him. Praise Him. Anybody else, you're dealing with that right now. You've got to break the cycle. Run down here. Come on, let's agree. There is power in agreement. Run down here if you want a prayer for that now. Just stand with me. Let's oh God, worship. the glory is Just yours. Stand with me. Let's the kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory Thank is you, yours. It's done. The glory it's is yours. It's broken. Oh God, the it's glory broken. is yours. It's the kingdom broken. is come it's and the broken. battle is over. It's broken. Jesus, in your name Shout we it. it's rise. Broken. The glory is Shout yours. It's broken. The glory is yours. It's oh God, it's the glory is yours. The, the kingdom is, is come and the battle it's is broken. over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. It's easy when we're around one another like this. When you come into this room and the music's playing and folks are praying and agreeing and the word is going forth, it's easy. We get strong. But when we get out there on the battlefield and we feel like we're all alone, the giant seems bigger than he is. That's why relationships are so important. Godly relationships. That's why we need each other. That's why you need to be in small groups, in life groups, praying for one another, being accountable to one another, encouraging one another. When we come in here on Sunday, it should be the celebration of what God has done all week. The people that you brought to your life group that got saved. The person that you brought to your life group that got delivered from alcohol or drugs or filled with the Holy Spirit. When we come in here on Sunday, it ought to be a time to rejoice and celebrate what God has done the past six days. Every week. Does that make sense? So invite your family and friends to your life groups. Get them in the small group. Bring them in here on Sunday to celebrate with us. 
and to hear some of the testimonies in the stories. That's why I tell you in the, in the life group, share your story, tell your story. It's so important. People need to hear your story. They need to hear what God did for you. Because if I hear what God did for you, Steve, I know that God can do it for me. I, I believe. It, it builds my faith. If, if I hear what God does for you, I know God can do it for me. David, if, if I hear what God does for you, I know He can do it for me. Tony, if I, if I hear what God did for you, I know He can do it for me. If you hear what God did for me, then you can believe He will do it for you. Does that make sense? We need one another. We're in the battle of the century, the battle of the millennium. Things are winding down. So don't just float through life. Don't take it for granted. Gear up. Put on your battle gear. Equip yourself in the Word of God. And let's take some folks to heaven with us. Let's defeat some giants. Let's defeat some demonic strongholds. Let's break them together. Because we are better together. We are better together. We need each other. Look at what God has done in this house. Look at, look at the diversity. Look at the gifts and the talents. There's so much in this room. We need each other. Connect with one another. Help me fill this place next Sunday to hear about the next giant. You don't want to miss it.